Senate File 780 is the Omnibus Agriculture, Rural Development and Housing Finance Bill. Uh, members, uh, this bill uh, includes about $220 million for the budgets uh, of the Department of Agriculture, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, as well as the Board of Animal Health and AURI, the Ag Utilization Research Institute. Members, um, the governor had proposed uh, several things, uh, as long with, along with uh, some new fee increases and new, uh, several new FTEs. Uh, this bill lives within our means. Uh, we had a zero target, and so we've uh, met that target. Uh, we've uh, not uh, funded the, the new FTEs. We have not added new fees in this bill, but we have met many of the things the governor has asked for and uh, some of his priorities, some of our priorities as legislators. Let me uh, hit the highlights of, of s several of those areas. And uh, we've had a, a very good committee process uh, working together, Democrats and Republicans. And uh, before we get into the details, I do want to just uh, call out our staff, uh, the DFL research staff, Republican research staff, and our committee administrator, Kyle Burnt, CLA Joel Hansen, Greg Knopf, and Dan Mueller from Senate Council. Uh, as you all know, they put in incredible hours in making the committee run smooth, and I want to thank them for all the contributions they've made and uh, members that helped participate in putting this bill together. So, members, some highlights of this bill, first of all, the governor uh, had asked for an increase in AURI, $340,000 a year into their base budget. We have uh, met that with $300,000 in increase to help AURI and their mission. Their mission uh, started some 30 years ago to help bring more innovation and value-added opportunities and markets for ag products. They are specifically focused on adding value to agriculture products. And so uh, they are a key part of our state. They have offices uh, across the state, headquarters in Crookston, Minnesota. But they really work across the state wherever the new ideas there are. They've got a food lab uh, down in Marshall. And uh, members, this is an aspect of uh, how we bring more value not just raise corn and beans or livestock, but what can we do to that product before uh, it, it just gets shipped off to, uh, to another country. And so uh, we've met the governor's request by and large in AURI, and we've uh, focused on that. The Board of Animal Health is also funded in this bill, a $10 million, a little, little, just under $11 million a year. Uh, we all uh, know how important the Board of Animal Health is. Many times they fly below the radar because they just are continually doing their job. But when, when diseases come through like we had a year, year or so ago with the avian flu, everybody knew we had a Board of Animal Health and they were working overtime to uh, deal with that type of a crisis. And that's why we've got uh, them funded uh, in, in this bill as well. The Department of Agriculture members, uh, we fund the administrative costs uh, all but their, at their base level, except for $300,000. We also have funded the Agri Fund, which is uh, the, the remaining tails uh, from ethanol uh, payments. If many of you remember, uh, what started the ethanol industry here in Minnesota was a partnership with the state in productive production incentive credits or payments. We have well over a dozen ethanol plants running strong in this state today, uh, being a part of our uh, value-added opportunities and an economic engine in our state. Uh, the agri-funds work to continue that type of a mission. And so uh, we've got agri-funded in this bill with a focus on value-added opportunities and uh, ways to uh, continue bringing and enhancing uh, wealth and uh, products in our state. Members, uh, a few highlights under the Agri Fund. Uh, we've had in the past a, a tried and true method of value added in this state, which is livestock. Livestock is very important to agriculture. 
Agriculture contributes about 25 percent of our economy, and uh, livestock's a key aspect. The livestock investment grants have been funded at $2 million a year. We bumped that up to $3 million a year under this fund. Because if you look at the results and how this has worked for small farmers, beginning farmers, family farmers, there are many across your districts, many of your districts, that have used this fund, 10,000, 20,000, 34,000, 50,000. Uh, it's a 10 percent match on the, on the expansion of their livestock operation. But that means we've got more livestock being raised and processed and uh, consuming uh, grains in this state. And so we've tried to uh, add the focus to something that's tried and true, uh, through and through. Uh, we've got livestock, and Minnesota's a great livestock uh, state. And so we've uh, tried to enhance that and uh, uh, st remain committed to what we know is a great value-added opportunity. We've also uh, enhanced some value-added grants. Uh, there's many uh, grants that the Department of Agriculture has administered and given out, taken applications for, whether it's enhancing some cheese processing or other types of uh, agriculture or uh, enhancement of products. That's what the value-added grants are for. We've added in two uh, larger grants to help promote an expansion of processing in our state. And so uh, we look forward to continuing to have a strong ag sector and processing in our state under this bill. We've also um, added some bills. Uh, Senator Herr had a bill with, with us, uh, the, with our committee. Uh, talking about how do we, uh, how do we reach out to uh, Hmong families that uh, have a long, rich history in farming, uh, but don't always uh, have a great connection to uh, farms that are for sale or farming opportunities. And uh, the Hmong Chamber of Commerce, uh, through uh, Senator Herr's bill, would uh, uh, receive $100,000 of funding to help make that connection for a two-year uh, period of pilot project, but a, a two-year period to make them, uh, help them uh, make this happen in a reality for uh, the Hmong uh, families that uh, are rich in farming heritage and uh, a great opportunity to uh, help enhance th those opportunities for urban agriculture. Or uh, as Senator Herr would talk about, uh, these constituents will move out of his district and he'll lose them. And so that was the saddest part about him uh, wanting to promote this uh, bill. But uh, for the greater good, he uh, did bring it to our committee, and we were interested in, in, in that as well. Uh, Senator Frentz uh, and uh, Senator Draham had uh, rollover, tractor rollover language, which we've uh, uh, funded in this bill, uh, helping uh, keep focused on, tr on farm safety. and. Uh, Farm Business Advocates, Senator Eakin had a bill to help enhance uh, about, about $20,000 uh, of an increase in the Farm Business Advocates we've, we've given in this bill. And uh, folks with the agriculture, uh, going into a phase of not as profitable years as we've seen uh, three and four years ago, uh, the Farm Business Advocates uh, unfortunately might become busier and uh, this has been a uh, long-standing program for when farmers uh, really are, are, are running into some crisis uh, situations with financial statements and figuring out how to streamline their operation. Uh, farm business advocates have been an, an option and a helpful source, and so that we've uh, increased uh, that, that funding by $20,000 under this bill. And so members, uh, you can go through many of the other uh, smaller aspects uh, of this bill, but. Uh, one, one additional uh, incentive and an opportunity that I want to quickly touch on, but it's Senator Weber uh, brought this to our committee, is uh, the opportunity of uh, adding value to shrimp in Minnesota. A uh, unique, innovative, uh, yes, I agree, peculiar scenario in Minnesota that we would raise shrimp. But members, the committee did their work. And we bring all the bills forward, and we try to research and figure out what uh, opportunities and what is this about. But uh, True Shrimp is a, a Minnesota company uh, that ha owns patents from Texas A&M. And uh, they have come forward and said, we would like to uh, stay here. We are, have been a long-standing family business in Minnesota, in rural Minnesota. But we have a, a unique but a real opportunity for our state. And uh, over 80% of the feed would have to come from the state of Minnesota. 
the opportunity of them building nine-acre harbors uh, would add millions to the economy and offer investment opportunities to not just their company, uh, but uh, they would intend to only own 15 percent of the harbors. They would invest tens of millions of dollars and have to have shrimp production before any of the production incentive payments would go out as a uh, model, uh, just like the ethanol program was set up years ago. And so, uh, uh, members, we've tried to stick with the tried and true, but we've also tried to uh, enhance and really uh, find those additional new value-added opportunities, which is what the Agri Fund was originally set up for and kept under the Department of Agriculture. And so we think that brings some real job opportunities, real economic uh, stimulation to these rural communities uh, under the True Shrimp program that Senator Weber can talk a little bit more about. But members, I want to highlight that to you because uh, we try to uh, continue to pursue more innovation, more value added in our state of Minnesota. And so, uh, members, that, uh, that covers a lot of the Department of Agriculture aspects of this bill. Lastly, uh, we have uh, the housing also under this, uh, this budget. And it continues uh, uh, support for the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. We uh, fully fund the challenge grant program dealing with rural workforce housing shortages and workforce housing shortages across the state. The challenge fund has been uh, a longstanding good opportunity to uh, help be some contributing dollars to stimulate new and, and uh, 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 new, new housing opportunities. Uh, our committee also wants to continue seeing more home ownership opportunities, and we've, uh, we've uh, put some money into that as well as with down payment assistance and, and, and other opportunities. And another program that uh, Senator Coran brought to our, bill, our, our committee, and uh, we put a million dollars into it to uh, help preserve affordable housing in Minnesota, because one of the best ways to keep affordable housing and housing options is to make sure what's here doesn't go away. And uh, mobile home parks or manufactured home parks uh, often uh, run into aging infrastructure and scenarios where development is much more appealing. And when they get shut down, we lose all of those affordable housing options. So Senator, uh, Senator Coran, we've uh, uh, adopted his uh, proposal that uh, under uh, those that have uh, co-op type ownerships or uh, structures where the residents can own uh, their park or own their facilities, they can take ownership, they could receive some grants uh, for one-time improvements to infrastructure, but in addition they would have to uh, show that uh, they're accounting for this down the road and escrowing and uh, have plans to continue paying for their infrastructure. But we preserve, we preserve one of the probably the best or the most basic affordable housing options we have in this state, which is manufactured home parks that uh, also serve a key purpose in uh, the housing demand that we have across our state. And uh, so members, with that, I would uh, stand for questions. I would ask you to support this bill. And uh, again, uh, we, we met, met our zero target, but uh, I think we've got opportunity for lots of great innovation uh, and new uh, economic development uh, opportunities that we can enhance uh, through this Department of Agriculture and Minnesota Housing Finance Bill. Discussion on Senate File 780. I have Senator Dietzig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Chair Westrom and committee members, I want to thank you for your collaborative and thoughtful discussions during committee, uh, your hard work, and the hard work of staff and the nonpartisan staff putting uh, together this bill. Uh, Senator Westrom, I agree with you. Uh, the nonpartisan staff on committee, Greg Knopf, Dan Mueller, and Ben Stanley, have been great to work with, and I appreciate their advice and guidance. I'd also like to thank our pages for all their hard work in making the committee go smoothly. And I'd like to take the uh, CLA Joel Hansen and the CA Kyle Byrne for being available to answer questions and their help in making the committee and the committee meetings run e effective and efficiently. Uh, Senator Westrom or maybe Senator Weber, I do have some questions on the shrimp bill, so would either one of you yield? Senator Westrom will yield. Senator Dietzik. Um, thank you. Um, 
Mr. President. So on line uh, 1615 of the bill, it defines a facility eligible for payments for these shrimp payments. The facility must be located in Minnesota and begin production at a specific location by June 30th, 2025 and must not begin production before July 1st, 2019. Eligible facilities include existing companies as well as new companies. Um, uh, members, we have three shrimp companies already in Minnesota. Uh, we have one in Piers, Blooming Prairie, and I believe Elgin. So I'm wondering if they would qualify for this funding and how uh, existing companies would qualify for this funding. Senator Westrom. Well, Mr. President and uh, Senator uh, Dietzik, uh, not knowing exactly what your question was going to be, I'm happy to answer it, but uh, Mr. President, uh, Senator Weber uh, initially had this bill and I, uh, I would defer to uh, Senator Weber if he would want to uh, answer Senator Dietzik's questions and I can fill in uh, if there's additional questions. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, if we look at the requirements uh, of the legislation, um, the producer is, is going to have to meet certain criteria. Besides the being obviously present in Minnesota, uh, they are also going to be able to have to produce at least 25,000 pounds of shrimp per quarter. Per quarter. They're going to have to be able to prov uh, prove that 80% of the feed uh, that they are uh, feeding is, is coming, is being purchased in Minnesota. And so there are other uh, requirements that will be there. Now, I'm not familiar, uh, Mr. President or Senator Dietzik, with the, the companies that you mentioned. Uh, but at the end of the day, if uh, they are able to meet the criteria, uh, then obviously they, they can qualify. Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Weber. So also on uh, line 1624, I like that uh, the payments are not transferable. Then if you go to line 1629, it, um, so before we talk about a facility and how to make a, be an eligible facility, and then if you go to line 1629, it talks about eligible producers. Uh, the facility needs to be located in Minnesota, but do the producers or the people who are um, own the company, do they need to live in Minnesota? Senator Desick, you're requesting Senator Weber yield. Senator Weber. Um, I was quickly reviewing the, the lines you mentioned. Could you repeat the gist of your que question, Senator Desick? Senator Desick. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Weber, for yielding. On line 1621, so if you go back in the first uh, 1615 to 1621, it talks about a facility is eligible. They have to be located in Minnesota. And then it talks about the payments on 1629, the payments to the eligible producers of shrimp. So do the people who own the company and the producers, do they need to live in Minnesota or does the facility just need to be located in Minnesota? Senator Weber. Mr. President, Senator Dietzig, uh, it is certainly the facility needs to be in Minnesota. Is it possible that there might be investors in the facility, uh, Mr. President, that, that might reside out of, uh, out of the community? Uh, that's entirely possible. Um, you know, for example, Mr. President, if we were to have one of the harbors built uh, within a few miles of, of one of our state borders, uh, it is always possible that there could be investors uh, that, that may be from out of state. Or obviously in a community, if a, if a family member uh, said, hey, I would like to be an investor in that, it's possible for that to happen as well. Senator Dietzig. Um, thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Weber, would you yield for a follow-up? Yes. Senator, D Senator Weber, Weber will yield. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate that, Senator Weber. Uh, I, I understand that, especially when you live in a border community, that people go back and forth a lot. Um, in, in other bills, in the angel investment tax credit, in some of the equity bills we did last year, I, uh, Senator Nelson and others have wanted to make sure that some of this funding is equally divided across the state and is um, split up so that greater Minnesota has access for it, especially the angel investment tax credit, there's a specific language that says a portion of those tax credits need to be held 
for Greater Minnesota until September 1st, and then after that time, they're available to anybody. In the equity, one of the equity provisions that I worked on last year with Senator Nelson, we made sure that 50-50 was split. Um, in this, this money doesn't come available. It is in the tails of this bill, and so, uh, Senator Weber, I would like to keep working on you because I do think this is a potentially very good opportunity, but I also know in this bill it talks about funding to help uh, beginning farmers, there is money that I appreciate Senator Weber gave to uh, Senator Herbill to get more people of color and minorities into farming because uh, the Department of Ag told me that they literally will have people show up at their building saying, we want to farm. What do we do? And so I think the Senator Herbill that will help uh, give money to the minority ethnic councils and minority chambers will be able to do some outreach. And so. I would like to continue working with you, Senator Weber, as this, um, maybe not now as this bill goes through, because we do have a few years, but to how are we going to provide notice about this opportunity to other interested people to make sure that there are potentially some women and minority business owners that might want to be involved in this. When this true ship company came to visit me and when they came to the community, they talked about that you don't need a farmland to do this, you can do this in a warehouse. and so. Uh, I'd like to kind of have that conversation more to make sure that it is open and if there are other farmers, women farmers, women business owners, minority owners that are available that they have this opportunity to access this funds and then as we get to the point of where these funds are ready to be distributed, I would like to know and I think it would be good for the committee to hear back to find out where this money is being located and how much money. We do that in several funds and taxes where we do want to ask for a report to see where that money is being spent and is it being spent in doing what we wanted to do. So um, I appreciate your answering these questions and look forward to working with you to, uh, to get some of these answers and to get this information out to right, the right people. Thank you. Senator Weber. Were you looking for a follow-up question? Or just Okay, thank you, just a statement. Okay, for further discussion, I have Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. President. Th th thank you for the opportunity to stand and ask some questions about the bill that is before us. Uh, Mr. President, I'm sure that you were here yesterday when we went through the jobs bill, and yesterday we talked a lot about uh, and, uh, the, the equity provisions. Senator Hayden did an extraordinary job to sort of give context and why uh, the equity provisions were there both in the equity article but also throughout the uh, various uh, uh, budgets the year before. Then you also heard Senator Cohen echo the same sentiments and why equity was important and the commitment that was made not just by the Senate but also by the House leadership. And this year, one of the provisions that was also part of the jobs bill is now in this bill. And that housing notion was, uh, that was resourced was Build Wealth Minnesota. And Build Wealth M Minnesota under the Family Stabilization Fund here has been eliminated. So I have a couple of questions if, if, if uh, <clears throat> Senator Westrom will yield for a question. Senator Westrom will yield. Senator Westrom, I hear you talking about value added and how this particular bill talks about value added. Can you tell me if you had Bill Wealth Minnesota come in and testify uh, 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 in front of your committee? Senator Westrom. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Champion, uh, they did, they did not uh, come and testify, uh, nor, nor did they request to. Senator Champion, a follow-up? Yes. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, Senator Westrom a couple questions, so I, ask, so I hope that uh, he will continue to yield, Mr. President. Senator Westrom will yield. So if we want to look at value added and we want to decide if a program or initiative adds value, then we should ask people questions. And so, Senator uh, uh, Westrom, since you are yielding f for a question, can you please tell me what is Bill Wealth Minnesota and tell me what you know about that program? Senator Westrom. Uh, 
Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Champion, uh, uh, what I understand about their program is that they work with uh, people uh, trying to uh, improve their financial uh, credit scores and, and other financial literacy, uh, like many other nonprofits do across the state. Uh, they don't. They don't actually build houses or do anything to uh, uh, ensure we have more housing. Uh, uh, built across the state, uh, either from what I understand. Senator Champion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Westrom, for your response. In fact, the reason why Senator Westrom, Mr. President, doesn't know is because he never talked to them. If he, ought, if he had spoke to them, he would know that they help with residential loans. They deal with cost assistance. They deal with hardship funds stabilizing loan funds, home buyer education, financial literacy. And he actually, he being Senator Westrom, said earlier when he was talking about the manufacturing homes, he talked about down payment assistance and how important that was. It is, and I agree it is. But that's also something that Bill Wealth Minnesota does. Everything around home ownership is something that Bill Wealth Minnesota does. Um, Mr. President, I would like to see if Senator Westrom would yield for another question. Senator Westrom will yield. Senator Westrom, because you said home ownership is very important and I agree with you, can you tell me what the home ownership rate and gap is between whites and, Af and, and African Americans? Uh, Senator Westrom. Mis Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Champion, I don't, I don't have that number off the top of my head right now. M Senator Champion. Mr. President. Thank you again, and thank you, Senator Westrom. Mr. President, I don't mind waiting if uh, Senator Westrom would uh, be so kind as to get that information, because I'm sure that he would have access to that, that information, being that he's the chair and the author of this bill, and there's a home ownership provision here. So, Mr. President, is it fine if we wait a couple of minutes for Senator Westrom to, to uh, be able to locate the home ownership rates of African Americans and the gap between whites and African Americans and other people of color? Senator Westrom, do you want to yield for that question? Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know if uh, Senator Champion's calling for a recess. If, uh, if he is, he could make that motion, and uh, we could spend some time researching uh, that and many other questions if he wants to give us a list of questions. Uh, uh, that would be kind of unprecedented and something uh, I'm not aware of that's gone on. But uh, perhaps, Senator Champion, if uh, you have uh, some of this information, feel free to uh, entertain it as part of the debate uh, as we uh, move forward with this bill otherwise. Mr. Senator President, Champion, would you yield to the question from Senator Webbs? I sure would. Westrom. So, Senator Champion, I, I do have that information, but but I believe that it's important for the author to, to also have that information because he so eloquently talked about value added, and and I believe that it's important to have value added. But I I I also think it's disingenuous when we have a bill, and we cut programs, we don't ask them to come in. And we say the only reason why we don't have information about the program is because they didn't ask to come in. They didn't know if they were going to be cut. They didn't know if they were going to be treated so unfairly. And why this is important is because home ownership is important. As it's also important when you think in terms of manufactured home parks, which are mobile parks, and infrastructure in those mobile parks, that's important. I'm not at, in the least bit suggesting that that isn't important. But I also believe that the notion around equity is important. Equity is important, M Mr. President. And so from my vantage point, I, uh, if, if uh, Senator Westrom doesn't know and doesn't have access to that information, I, I'll be happy to go on. And so, so uh, the question is, if Senator Westrom would yield full question, if he doesn't have the information and, and if he doesn't have it available, he can tell us and I'll be happy to go forward. Senator Westrom, would you yield? Senator Westrom will yield. Uh, Mr. President, if uh, Senator Champion could repeat what the actual question is. Senator Champion. Question is, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Westrom, the uh, question is, what is the home ownership rate for African Americans and or other people of color, and what is the gap between whites and, and people of color? Yeah. Mr. President, Senator, Senator Champion. Senator Westrom. 
maybe, maybe you didn't hear, but I think I answered that question about three questions ago. I, I didn't have that information off the top of my head. Um, so if, if that yeah. answers your question or if there's something I'm missing, feel free to re-ask. Well, and I think part of your, Senator uh, Champion's original statement was you would answer, you would provide the data if Senator Westrom didn't have it handy, right? Thank you, Senator Mr. Champion. Champion. Uh, uh, Mr. President, so the answer is 77% of whites own their homes, where only 39% of all households of color own their homes. And the reason why that stat is important, and even though that stat may have changed just slightly because that's from uh, uh, the uh, most recent data that I have, it, it represents the largest gap in ownership since 1990. And, and when there is an initiative in a bill that is around equity that, that seeks to promote home ownership and make sure that there are loans and residential loans available, financial literacy available, getting people in homes, that is an important, an important initiative. And so I would say that it's unfortunate in this particular bill when we don't have added, added opportunities when it comes to equity, but we look at value added opportunities only when it's shrimp because that's what we heard a lot about, shrimp. Bill Wealth, Minnesota was never asked one question. So how would the author know? He, he doesn't, he just simply eliminated an equity provision because it was convenient. And so for that reason, I would ask when it comes down to it that we vote no on this provision. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have an amendment at the desk, the A-16. Senator Marty has the A-16 amendment. The secretary will report the A-16 amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend Senate File 780 as follows. Page 15, delete Section 8. This is Amendment A-16. Senator Marty, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This is the amendment I've been offering to all the bills to remove the policy language from the bill. Some are longer than others. This is only one provision, but um, I believe this provision actually is in, there is, a, I believe, a agriculture policy bill, which is a good place for it. Um, I think we should consider policy, but we should be debating it separately away from the budget bills. Um, I urge your support for this and be happy to stand for questions. And may, uh, Mr. Chair, I request a roll call and remind people that um, this is something I think a lot of people, both parties, say we should be doing, and that is separating the debate between budget and policy. The governor's made that clear as well. I think it'll help our session operate more smoothly if we pull these things out of these bills and put them in policy bills. Be happy to stand for questions. Uh, roll call requested. Roll call will be granted. Uh, further discussion on the A-16 amendment? Senator Weber? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I stand in, in opposition to the amendment. Um, I believe that as we look at the label compliance bill, um, and the, the language that is included there, let me tell you what, went, uh, what is behind that language in the first place. Last summer, the governor came out with an executive order that, that deals uh, with um, uh, the, the neonics and, and the verification of need. And, uh, and essentially, if we want to give just a very basic de definition of verification of need, what that amounts to is that before applicators or farmers uh, go out and treat their fields, they need to check in with the Department of Agriculture uh, in order to do so. Um, I have, tr at that time, uh, over six months ago, uh, the industry uh, approached uh, the department and asked uh, for uh, some explanation and some uh, information as it relates uh, to that particular issue. Uh, the department failed to respond. Uh, as we approached uh, this uh, bill, as we put together both the policy bill and Senator Westrom put together the finance bill, uh, we continued not to receive actually valid answers from the department as to what their intent was. 
Uh, this past Monday morning, at my request, there was a meeting between industry representatives and the department uh, wherein we, we talked about these issues. And uh, Mr. President, the reality of it is we still did not get adequate answers to our questions. Uh, there was just some vague reference, well, uh, no, we don't need to have people come out, no, you can just report this. Basically, in this accumulation of data, uh, they, they, this is what they're trying to do is have the report in as to where, uh, who's using what, et cetera. But yet the problem that we arrive at there is that when individual operators do this, uh, they are putting their information into the department, which at that point it becomes public information, and there's no protection, data pri uh, privacy protection on any of this. And so uh, you can understand why operators are concerned about releasing this information and not having any type of protection as a result of that. And so, um, you know, this, this is of a major concern. Also, when you're in the process of, of operating uh, and you have, uh, have aphids that have come into your soybean field, uh, you don't have a few days to wait for bureaucracy to get back to you. In a few days, you can lose a substantial portion of your potential yield in that particular crop. The other concern that I have is that if we start down the road of this type of regulation and permitting process, we are making Minnesota an outlier among, in the states around us. And uh, we are going to, and this is going to put Minnesota agriculture at a distinct disadvantage. And I understand that there are people that aren't happy with certain elements of, of chemicals, and, and I, I get that. But the reality of it is that in today's agricultural production, they are a, a valid and they are a common uh, factor in, in the industry. In Minnesota, it has always been the label is the law. And now if we are going to have the start of a new bureaucratic process uh, from, on the part of the department, then quite frankly, Mr. Chairman, we are going beyond that and we are creating a situation, as I stated earlier, that is not good uh, for our agricultural community and is not good for our producers. So as a result of that, um, I have tried to sit down with the, the, have the department come in and work out a solution to the problem. Uh, as I have stated, they continue not to be totally responsive and quite frankly, the problem that that creates is that it makes us even more suspicious of exactly what plans do they have that they wish to put in place once we leave town in, when we adjourn in May. And I think that the industry has valid concerns. I think that I have valid concerns, Mr. President. And um, as a result of that, uh, I wish uh, to, to oppose this particular amendment. And, and I think that we, need, um, that we need to turn it down. At this point in time, uh, I do have an amendment uh, that um, I'm waiting for the paperwork on. Okay, um, at this point in time, uh, if we may uh, proceed uh, uh, with other things, we're waiting for the paperwork to arrive and uh, I will have an amendment to the amendment at that point in time. Okay. Further discussion on the A16 amendment? Senator Marty. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I did not intend to debate the policy of it, and I hear he has an amendment to the amendment. Um, I, I, my goal is to have this removed from this bill, and we can debate the policy and the policy bill separate from this. Um, if you are waiting for an amendment to the amendment, I, I, my goal is to take out the provision, not to amend the provision. But what I will do is, if you're going to do that, rather than waste the body's time, I'll withdraw the amendment until you have your amendment. But again, my goal was not to deal with the policy. My goal was to take it out of this bill. I'm arguing the same on provisions one might like and one might not like that they don't belong in here. But if you're going to do it, I'll withdraw it temporarily until he has his amendment. Senator Marty withdraws the A16 amendment. Further discussion on Senate? Senate File 780. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Uh, this is um, 
as we talk about bioenergy and bioproducts, we also talk about installation of equipment, and that installation of equipment includes pipes, pipes that will get product from one point to another point. That includes pipes to help when you're talking about turf seed, as well as the, the development of other agricultural products, including housing within the Housing Finance Administration. And so members, I, I have for you um, Senate File A-5-0, amendment. The Secretary will report that A-5 amendment. Senator Hoffman moves to amend Next Senate State. File 780 as follows. Page 23 after line 10, insert. This is amendment A-5-0. Senator Hoffman, to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President and members. You know, as we do talk about the bioenergy and bioproducts and installation of equipment, I'm reminded of uh, Senator Senjum, who's had a rich history of, of trying to get us to be recalled about our obligation to make sure that water gets uh, provided from point A to point B. And so, members, we have bioenergy, which recalls for installation, which is talking about housing. And so with that, uh, I think housing and, and water is what they all have in common. So with that, uh, members, I hope you vote for the uh, mandatory fire, fire sprinkler uh, uh, prohibition in, in honor of uh, Senator Senjum. For the further discussion on the A50 amendment, Senator Westrom. Um, Mr. Chair, if Senator Hoffman would yield. Senator Hoffman will yield. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Hoffman, is this uh, virtually identical to uh, amendments we've had in the past? Senator Senjum uh, has been uh, notably uh, the chief author of. Senator Hoffman. Uh, uh, Madam, uh, Mr. President and uh, Senator, um, Senator uh, Westrom, I, I would like to uh, see if uh, Senator Senjum would, would yield to a question. Senator Senjum will yield. Thank Senator Senjum yields, yes. Thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Senjum, I don't want this to be the camel's nose, like Senator Westrom would say, the camel's nose under the tent, but could you uh, explain this uh, amendment that you have uh, graced us with all these years? Senator Senjum. Well, well thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Hoffman. Uh, Senator Westrom, this is uh, the uh, traditional annual, biannual, triannual sprinkler prohibition amendment. Uh, and uh, I know Senator Hoffman has a good heart. He's trying to make your bill better. And, uh, uh, you know, it needs a little work. You know that. And uh, this will help it a lot. So I hope that you can support uh, this amendment. Uh, it's certainly germane. There's no question about that. The shrimp and water and everything like that. Water resides in sprinklers. So there's certainly an element of germaneness here, which is undeniable. And so I hope that uh, you think a little bit about this and go forward and accept it. Senator uh, Westrom. Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, members, uh, I think this makes a good bill even better. So I'd urge your support and let's uh, sprinkle it in the bill. Senator Bach. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Sengem yield? Senator Sengem will yield. Uh, Senator Sengem, I know you're a former leader here and you know a lot about the Senate rules uh, and you know a lot about germaneness. I'm, I'm just wondering if you think it might be appropriate for uh, a fireworks amendment to be added as an amendment to the A50 if you think that would, uh, would meet the germaneness test because I, you know, I don't want to have counsel go to a lot of work drafting it if, you, if under, with your expertise you think it wouldn't be germane. Senator uh, Sengem. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Bach. Uh, yeah, I do. There's, uh, this particular bill has a lot about housing in it, of course, and houses have decks, and decks are, frankly, where you sit to uh, watch fireworks. So there's certainly clear linkage there in terms of germaneness. And I think uh, if you wanted to bring forth that amendment right now, I think we should uh, give it serious consideration. It, it fits the bill perfectly, and it makes it even better. Senator DeBach? Well, Senator Sundrum, I really appreciate your counsel, and uh, I'll, I'll see if I can get together with counsel in a timely fashion, and, and, and if we don't run out of time here, maybe I can get something put together. 
Further discussion on the A50 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A50 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. No. Eyes passed. Motion passes. <laughs> Further discussion on Senate File 780. Senator Sparks. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have the A12 amendment. The Secretary will report the A12 amendment. Senator Sparks moves to amend Senate File 780 as follows. Page 19 after line 26, insert. This is amendment A12. Senator Sparks to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President and members. The A12 amendment, I'm asking for your help in providing resources for many families impacted by flooding in southern Minnesota. A powerful storm moved through southern Minnesota, uh, impacting over 20 counties. The hardest hits areas span the south central counties of Blue Earth, Waseca, Freeborn, Lesueur, Steele, and Rice counties. The uh, Quick Start Disaster Relief Program is offered by the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and has been a very successful program, um, which offers relief to those who are hit hard um, during these flooding uh, hardships. However, uh, recently, as recently as Monday, it came to my attention that the Quick Start Program is short on funding. I talked to uh, Chairman Westrom ab about this amendment, and if I had uh, known about this sooner, obviously I would have introduced a bill and brought it through the committee process, but basically, Mr. President and member, what the A12 amendment um, would allow is for the commissioner to allocate, she may allocate a portion of the appropriation of the Economic Development and Housing Challenge Program for assistance to areas included in the Disaster Relief Area-4290 as provided in Minnesota statutes. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I would ask for member support. Discussion on the A-12 amendment. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. Uh, President and uh, members, uh, Senator Sparks did talk to me about this. Uh, we've looked it over uh, uh, and staff has and uh, we think it would be a friendly amendment and uh, thank him for bringing it forward to Senator Jasinski, uh, uh, Dreheim and uh, Senator Frentz uh, all uh, would have affected areas of, from the storm and so uh, we look forward to working on that. And, and it's uh, permissive in language, and so I, I view it as a very friendly amendment. Further discussion on the A-12 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A-12 amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Further discussion on, the, on Senate File 780? Senator Weber. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I do have the, my amendment here uh, if uh, Senator Marty would like to proceed. Senator Marty. Mr. President, I will um, pick up the A16 and move that amendment again. The Secretary will report the A16 amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend Senate File 780 as follows. Page 15, delete Section 8. This is Amendment A16. Senator Marty, to your and amendment. Mr. President, just to remind members, this was to delete the policy language from the bill. It's only one section in this case, but I urge your support. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have the uh, A23 amendment as an amendment to the amendment uh, A16. The secretary will report the A23 amendment to the A16 amendment. Senator Weber moves to amend the Marty Amendment to Senate File 780 as follows. Page one after line two, insert. This is amendment A23. Senator Weber to your amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. It, it always seems that our answer to everything is more regulation and that somehow that automatically solves all the problems. The purpose of this amendment is actually to uh, bring back some more regulation. Uh, in 2006, uh, the legislature removed all the elements of uh, regulation as a as it uh, applies uh, to the apiary business or the beekeeping business. 
Um, at that time, uh, it was removed. Uh, in 2008, we started to have more problems with the loss of uh, bees and hives, and, and uh, perhaps it's time that if we really need to regulate everyone, that we bring this uh, regulation back into place. And therefore, Mr. President, um, I, uh, is, that is the purpose of the 823 amendment. It actually brings the um, brings the uh, language that was in code uh, for the regulation uh, of the beekeeping business at that time and puts it back into statute. Further discussion on the A23 amendment? Senator Marty. Um, Mr. President, uh, Senator Weber, a um, interesting amendment. It's, it's kind of a totally different direction than trying to take policy out of the bill to put some more policy, even if it's budget related, but policy into the bill with regulation, and most of what I'm hearing about bees and pollinators is that the problems they're having is with other occurrences in agriculture community and so on, not anything to do with the beekeepers not doing the right thing. Um, I'd oppose the amendment. I think I'm trying to get out policy, not put more in um, and oppose this amendment. And um, I don't know if there's germaneness. I'm not the expert in rules on whether it's germane to try and amend an amendment with something that's not germane to that amendment. I think they may have to be germane both to the underlying bill, which that amendment would be, and also to the amendment they're amending, but I'm not the expert on that. So I will challenge the germaneness and ask the chair for ruling. Senator Weber. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, basically, I, I, I believe that the amendment is germane. Um, actually, um, the underlying language that, that Senator Marty is trying to take out, regardless of what the purpose of him taking it out is, uh, still deals with verification of need. Uh, it deals with verification of need in order to uh, apply to the, a certain industry. That's the reason that it's there. Therefore, if we're going to talk about that industry and we're going to have regulations as it relates to that industry, then quite frankly, uh, we can have the, uh, the language and the regulatory language in place uh, for that industry, and I believe that it is germane. Mr. President. Further advice on the eight, on the Jermaine Thank you, uh, Senator Ms. Dibble. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, the uh, the amendment to the amendment is clearly uh, quite far afield from the underlying amendment that Senator Marty offered. Um, I believe that uh, uh, if if we're going to follow just the plain reading of of our rules, um, that's clear. But also, if we're going to call uh, uh, if we're going to make use of custom and precedent, we had. Um, a similar uh, objection to an amendment to an amendment that I offered a few nights ago that was, I think, clearly relevant both to the amendment as well as the underlying bill, and it was ruled uh, uh, out of order and 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 dismissed. So, uh, Mr. President, uh, I think this is clearly very, very far afield from the intent uh, that Senator Marty is trying to accomplish, which is to remove a, a policy provision of the bill. A, it's removing a policy provision. B, it's removing a policy provision um, pertaining to the regulation of pesticides. Pesticides. This has to do with... Mr. President, it seems to me that the President should not be consulting with another member when uh, an objection is being raised to a point of order. Um, you need to uh, consult with the Secretary, but, well, but not with another member against the rules. So, Thank well, Mr. President, I think I've made my point. I believe it's very, very far afield from what Senator Marty is trying to accomplish. Um, I think it also, uh, in terms of precedent set in this very chamber uh, just a few nights ago, um, uh, would also guide uh, your decision. Anything further? Any further discussion on the A23? Other way, um, uh, on the germaneness, uh, President rules it not germane. Senator Weber? To the A16 amendment then? Yes, to the A16 amendment. I continue to rise in opposition to the A16 amendment. 
Uh, I think uh, we have uh, actually, we have turned down that amendment uh, in most instances uh, so far. I think that in this particular uh, situation, and, and we still, I am going to address the, the language that is being removed, the importance of it to the agricultural community, and, uh, and I would encourage uh, everyone uh, to have a no vote on the amendment. Thank you. Further discussion on the A16 amendment. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. President, uh, members, I would, uh, I too would rise to uh, ask members to vote uh, no on the Marty amendment. Uh, Senator Marty has uh, multiple times brought up the argument of uh, not having policy in a finance bill. Uh, certainly, uh, he is. Uh, a stalwart uh, uh, pusher of, of trying to uh, keep policy out of finance bills. Uh, I am uh, not as concerned as Senator Marty is. Uh, it's always interesting, uh, depending upon if it's a Republican in the governor's office uh, or a Democrat in the governor's office. Uh, uh, irrespective of that, it seems like they all seem to ask the legislature not to put policy in a bill. Uh, there is no reason we can't include policy. And in most cases, uh, you have to have some policy uh, connected to uh, finance bills, because uh, otherwise it would just be a list of numbers. And uh, you ultimately need uh, language to uh, incorporate what a uh, funding, is, funding is for and how you want uh, direction to the agencies. And so, uh, members, uh, this is uh, appropriately in this bill as well. And uh, I would urge you to uh, keep this language in and uh, deal, with, uh, deal with it here as we go forward. Uh, this is a big concern to uh, those in the ag community. And uh, I think it'd be best for people to understand what this language is, as Senator Weber has uh, amply uh, discussed. But um, for those of you uh, that maybe aren't as familiar with farming and agriculture, uh, pesticides and herbicides are uh, properly used uh, they are a, a key part of uh, keeping weeds down and uh, keeping bugs and infestations out. And there is technology out there, and uh, folks that have met with me in the last uh, year or so, that using uh, infrared and airplane or drone technology, they can hover over crops and based on infrared detect infestations before even uh, the field is detected by crop walkers or those that go out and uh, look for, for weeds or infestations. And my point in bringing that up is one of the reasons in that they, this company is trying to develop a mark in the market is they can help avoid crop loss that much faster and sometimes catching an infestation in a corner of a field before it spreads to the whole field and then properly and quickly uh, treating it with the proper uh, herbicide or pesticide can even avoid having those pests spread throughout the entire field, saving even more yield potential. And I bring that up because this verification of need that the go governor has uh, started to push uh, to the chagrin of uh, most ag community, uh, ag groups, uh, farmers union, farm bureau, corn growers, wheat growers, the run it runs the gamut. And they're supposed to ask for permission or ask for a permit after they give ample evidence that there's a verification or a need to spray this field, uh, the pest or the weeds or whatever it is that they've detected. That is what farmers do all the time. That is their job. Uh, they protect their crop because that is their livelihood. And they make the best determination. The EPA. Uh, is the one who labels these products after many years of testing in the first place. It's a legally sold product that's got a label of how to apply it. We have commercial applicators in many cases that are trained on how to do this. Farmers do this for a living. They know how to do it. And if you can get to that field quicker, and with the drone technology and other airplane technology that I just referenced, if you can get to that infestation even sooner, you can limit the how much spray, limit 
the crop damage by getting to it right away. The language in the bill that Senator Marty is taking out does the exact opposite. And it says government, uh, farmers, you can only move at the speed of government. And we all know what that means, another word for slow. And Friday evening, if they detect an infestation, I'll guarantee you there's not going to be too many in the government agencies around Friday night or Saturday morning to evaluate this verification of need and then give permission. And so you wait till Monday, you've probably got an infestation across the entire field if you've caught it in the first place in a corner of a field. And that farmer is going to be out there as soon as they can, spending the least amount possible to eradicate that infestation or those weeds because that costs them money and that affects their bottom line too. And so members, to bring this home to the rest of you that maybe uh, aren't that familiar with farming, the c example came up by Senator uh, Goggin uh, in our uh, uh, Ag Committee. And he said, have you ever sprayed dandelions in your yard? And of course, most people would answer yes to that question. Now imagine if you, uh, as the homeowner, had to go get permission and verify the need of spraying dandelions in your front yard. I don't think most homeowners would appreciate that kind of extra bureaucratic red tape just to take care of something as simple as dandelions that they know how to take care of. They go buy a legal product off the shelf. That's what you're asking farmers to potentially do under this a new administrative rules that the governor is trying to push through the Department of Ag. And so uh, stand up for farmers, stand up for what they do in their livelihoods and uh, how uh, they preserve their farms and livelihoods and help them be able to treat that uh, pest or weed as quick as possible, the best way possible, as soon as possible. I'd urge a no vote on this amendment. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Wenstrom, your comments sort of suggest why policy should not be in budget bills. I heard that maybe the Ag Committee had a long debate about this provision, but in a budget bill, we don't have as much time on that. And when I read the exact wording of this little section here, you do talk about how they need to, the department may not, must not require an applicator to demonstrate need prior to applying. But it also talks about to demonstrate label compliance in the department, which does license pesticide applicators, including in a lot of suburban communities on their lawns and people who have insect roaches or whatever in their house, that they are licensed by the department and by this language, unless explicitly required by FIFRA, they cannot require any of that. So it seems to me what you're gonna do if nothing else is tie it up in courts. And this is a good issue to discuss. And it should be discussed in a policy bill, but putting it into budget bills, and this is one good provision, and I gotta say this bill, it's the only one in this one, but uh, the transportation bill coming up later has like 50 or 100 things. We've got enough of an issue trying to deal with the budget. We should have these debates. You should have these debates. I assume you debated this for half an hour or whatever in the Ag Committee, that's fine but it should travel as a policy bill. It shouldn't be put into a budget bill with everything else. Hundreds of things the House is gonna put into these bills that we may never see except in conference committee. And we are expected to vote on a whole package that contains things that we've never seen before because the other House thought they were good policy provisions and ought to put them in. That's why we should, and I'm, I'm told, and I'm not sure this is correct, I haven't been tracking it that carefully, but I was told by somebody earlier that this is also in an agricultural policy bill. Let it move in there, not in here. That's all I need to say on it. I urge your support for withdrawing this section and ask for a roll call earlier. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Weber. Uh, Mr. President, I impose a call of the Senate. Senate under, is under call. Senator, 
Senator Weber, is the roll call for the balance of this bill? Yes, it is. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. President, I, I do intend that for the balance of, of the bill, and I move that further proceedings under the call be dispensed with, and the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Further discussion on the A-16 amendment. Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on the A-16 amendment. All senators have voted. The secretary will close the roll. There being 29 ayes and 38 nays, the amendment failed. Further discussion on Senate File 780. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to step out of the boundaries just a little bit. And I would like to thank Senator Dietzik for serving on the Ag and Rural Development and Housing Committee. Um, she is the only female on that committee. She has definitely taken a vested interest in this. Her conversation, obviously, and uh, talking with Senator Weber and her interest in, in developing the shrimp uh, issue. And also, I just wanted to point out, Senator Dietzik, that uh, your interest in the Minority Loan Forgiveness Program, I think that's a very worthy worthy issue that we should continue to explore. And in fact, in 2011, we did, um, I did, it was actually my bill, and I'm very proud of this bill. It's the Immigrant and Minority Pilot Microloan Program. And it's through the Rural uh, Finance Authority. And that's something I think, as you said, there is great interest from our immigrants and minorities to do agricultural production. And I think we should support that. Uh, perhaps ongoing, we should take a look at that, Senator Dietzik and Senator Westrom and all the members of that committee. So again, thank you very much for your involvement, Senator Dietzik. Any further discussion? Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Uh, we did have good discussions on housing, and I was going to uh, mention in the end that um, I do appreciate some of the creative ways that Senator Westrom attempted to find housing. Um, I was a little disappointed that, as Senator Champion pointed out, there was some shifting of money away from the metro area. 
uh, after we had the good, uh, we had many good conversations on housing in the area, um, in the committee on both uh, metro and rural issues, because it is a, it isn't just a metro area issue, it isn't just a rural area issue, it is a Minnesota issue. And when we got on the elevator to go up um, upstairs after the committee, all of us members decided we needed to keep having that conversation because this is such an important issue. We heard bills in the committee. Uh, Senator Weber had the bill on the Class Act. I think it was Senator Abler's bill on uh, homes for all. And having a stable housing improves kids' lives. It improves their outcomes in school, and it is so important to all of us. And the rural communities and, and in the metro area, people need homes and people, there's jobs available in certain areas, but there's no homes. And so I look forward to working with people on the committee and with Senator Westerman and with you, Senator Rosen, to continuing that conversation because we do need to uh, resolve some of these housing issues. Thank you. Is it S Senator Chamberlain. I pay attention to my work here, Mr. President. Um, I'm sorry, I do have one amendment. <laughs> Senator Chamberlain, you, the amendment? Yes, the number. 11 amendment, uh, Mr. President. And we spoke to uh, uh, Senator Westrom and the committee, and they expressed uh, willingness to take the amendment. Oh, it's the second. Yes. Uh, the secretary will report the A11 amendment. Senator Chamberlain moves to amend Senate File 780 as follows. Page 23 after line 10, insert. This is a, amendment A11. And to your amendment, Senator Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, uh, referring to housing too, this is indirectly related to this. Uh, we have part of this bill in, our, in the tax bill. This is a uh, uh, part for the uh, um, ag bill. It's about manufactured home parks and it just has to do with some uh, educational requirements for owners, managers of privately owned manufactured home parks. Uh, so um, we have part of a deal to lower the class rate from 1.25 to 1. So just some educational requirements for those park owners and managers. Thank you. Discussion on the A11 amendment. Senator Westrom. Uh, Mr. Chair or Mr. President and uh, uh, members, uh, I, this would be a friendly amendment. I've, they've talked to me and I understand and it's a uh, language that's easier and better to carry in the housing uh, portion of this bill than, than ultimately the tax bill. So uh, I view it as a friendly amendment. Further discussion on the A11 amendment? Seeing none, we will vote. All in favor of the A11 amendment say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Further discussion on our bill? Seeing none, the Secretary will give Senate File 780 its third reading. Senate File 780, a bill for an act relating to state government appropriating money for agriculture and housing programs. Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, glad that we were able to finally get to third reading in this bill. And uh, this is typically a bill that I wouldn't stand up to talk about. Uh, it's been an interesting, and it's interesting every single year to talk, listen to those who understand agriculture talk about yields and bushels and neonicotoids. And now it sounds like drones is in the conversation. Uh, so it is a very interesting issue. Uh, but Mr. President, I rise and I listen intently to my good friend, uh, Senator uh, champion, and even to some extent, uh, Senator Desick talk about some of the housing provisions uh, that are in the bill. I guess first, uh, I would probably think that there wasn't a connection between the Agriculture Committee and the Housing Committee. Um, when I first saw this back in January, I didn't quite know uh, how it would work. Um, and now I stand today when the omnibus bill in front of us, and some of my fears were confirmed that probably those two things shouldn't have been put together. And one of the reasons is that if you heard Senator Champion uh, in his uh, conversation that he was having with Senator Westrom, and as he was asking him the questions about housing, specifically about the issue of disparities or the gaps in housing, uh, Senator Westrom, uh, you know, very honestly and earnestly 
didn't, have an, did, did, didn't know the answer to the question. It's not something that he thought about. It's not something clearly that the committee thinks about. It's not something that was in his wheelhouse, thinking about this issue of income uh, disparity as it relates to housing. Well, members, as Senator Champion has articulated to you, we have one of the greatest, greatest gaps in home ownership in the country right here in Minnesota. Over 71, 72, 73 percent of white Minnesotans own a, 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 a home, and between 39 and 41 percent, depending upon what study you have, says that African Americans own a house. Now, members, I won't take all your time to tell you what this issue of home ownership does, because if it's a reflective of this body, 71 to 75 percent of us has a home. So you know what it does for you to house your family. You know what it does in terms of providing protection. You know what it does in terms of creating community. You know what it does in terms of giving you some economic security and some potential uh, to grow or to send your kids to college or to start uh, a new job. You know what those things do because you benefit from it. However, there is a lot of people in this community that doesn't. And so though we, Bobby, or excuse me, Senator Champion talked about the issue of build wealth, but what he was really talking about was the ability for us to invest money in organizations that allow people to live the Minnesota and American dream, which is home ownership. And the problem with the discourse here was that Senator Westrom and then thus the committee didn't know. I would have been much more impressed if they said, listen, Here's our thought process, here's what happened. We sat down, we talked to them, we talked to the agency, uh, and we know we got a problem here. We just didn't think that this was the path to go down. Senator Miller yesterday came under some scrutiny from us, but Senator Miller did say that I did talk to those folks. We did have a day to listen to what they have, and I thought the best way to go was to start to move forward and to put this in a competitive bidding process. Now, mind you, members, I objected to that, too. But I understood what Senator Miller was trying to do. So I want to be clear. This isn't an attack or a personal attack on Senator Westrom. As a matter of fact, I consider him a friend and a good friend. What it is is, members, I think we have to, with all of the things that we do, we have to keep our eye on the ball with this issue of equality and disparities. We can no longer just kind of continue to just say, well, I don't know, I'm not interested. Because if that was the case, members, we could all do it. There's a lot of things I don't know. I was down in Senator Sparks' uh, uh, neck of the woods and learned all about biofuel and ethanol, right? And then come to find out that there is a plant or a refinery somewhere in my district that I didn't know. So you would be, if you just take a little bit of time, you would find out that those things are important. These issues are important. And so what I want to make sure that the body understands, and in particular Senator Westrom, uh, and, and I know he does, Senator Westrom is a good man and a great senator. But we have to pay attention to these issues. These issues are important for the well-being and the growth of Minnesotans. We should be ashamed of ourselves. I am ashamed of myself that I serve in a legislature that allows us to have these continuing gaps and they're growing. I said I'm ashamed of myself because I want to make sure that if anybody looks around, I'm, I'm talking about all of us. This is an important issue. And what I'm finding is throughout this bill, bill after bill after bill, after one year is unwinding and taking away the little bit of progress we had on equity. We are repealing that taking away, moving it around, don't really know who's who and what's what, haven't really taken the time to figure that out. And members, we must and we have to do better if we're going to live up to our creed as stewards and leaders in this community. Senator Wester, any final comments to your bill? Oh, excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Excuse me, uh, uh, Senator Westrom, I missed uh, one up front here, so if we could hold, get you to hold just a second. Senator Herr. 
I just want to uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. President. I just want to join hand in support of Senator Bobby Joe Champion and the comment that Senator Jeff Hayden just made. And I really appreciate that uh, uh, Senator Westrom did hear my, my bill on connecting the ethnic minority chamber um, to work with uh, ethnic minority to, for farm, farming opportunity. And just want to let people to be clear that this provision is not about equity. This provision is about opportunity. So just want to be clear on that, that it's not a mixture that we are taking, uh, taking care of equity. The equity that's brought forth by Senator uh, Babito Champion and Senator Hayden are real. But the language that I appreciate Senator Westrom include it in the farming opportunity is, again, an opportunity bill. Thank you. No, I don't think any. Senator Westrom, final words. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and uh, members, thank you for uh, uh, the very good debate. Uh, first of all, uh, Senator Hayden, uh, in response to your comments, uh, I just want to make it clear, I uh, never said I wasn't interested uh, in responding to Senator Champion's uh, question. Uh, I imagine he could have come up with several questions that uh, I wouldn't have had the answer on or most anybody in this chamber wouldn't necessarily. I could come up with questions that you wouldn't have an answer on uh, as well. But uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Hayden, I didn't say I wasn't interested. Uh, you did add that in your comments and I just wanted to make sure that's clear. Uh, housing issues are very important across the entire state. When we've got the housing uh, finance budget, uh, it becomes important to put those dollars to the best use in preserving or building housing uh, by the square foot and actually having programs on the ground so people have a place to call home. And so uh, broadly, uh, members, we have uh, taken our target, taken the money in here and tried to uh, continue what has proven to work. But also I want to mem members to note, because I don't think it came out in the debate uh, discussion with uh, Senator Champion, uh, that entity, just like other entities, and they're even called out in the bill, if you look at, uh, at that provision of the bill, uh, to qualify for the grants that are still available uh, under Minnesota Housing Finance. And so there's uh, all probability and a strong likelihood they can continue. They just aren't guaranteed, but they are called out as an eligible entity to apply for those grants. Members, this bill, uh, not one of our biggest budget bills in the state, but a very important bill. Agriculture is a nearly 25% of Minnesota's economy. And most of what is done in agriculture is done because the men and women out in the fields, the men and women working in the processing plants, the men and women that own the value-added commodity uh, businesses, small businesses across our state, are just doing the best they can to provide a job, to provide themselves a living, but add value to a product and a commodity we can grow in abundance in this state. And so this bill really focuses on jobs, new innovative opportunities through market research, market development that the governor has asked for, and looking at innovative ways to continue what we know is tried and true like livestock, but also look at new opportunities that our committee and our state and our legislature is presented with for future jobs and future economic growth throughout our state, as we've talked about in the True Shrimp proposal, that I will remind you is two years out in the tails of this bill because that will be the time it takes to uh, get them up and running and they will be investing in their own tens of millions of dollars building the first harbor before they even get to production. But it's that innovation that our Agri Fund was set up for it's that type of economic opportunities that we want to continue supporting, uh, help incubate, and help them continue to be a strong industry like we see the ethanol industry in so many communities across rural Minnesota. It has added value to the price of grain in our state because of that. 
and we want to continue down that path with more economic value-added opportunities in agriculture, and this bill does that. And I look forward to your support. I look forward for, for us to continue embracing agriculture, helping it along where we can, but really helping get out of the way and let those in the agriculture industry do what they do so best, which is grow crops, raise livestock, process it, and feed the state and feed the world. I urge your support. The secretary will take the roll. All senators having voted, the secretary will close the roll. There being 42 ayes and 25 nays, the, the bill is passed and its title is agreed to. <laughs>